Dr. David Wilson is a NERC Independent Research Fellow at UCL. He started his academic career in Cambridge, where he also stayed for his PhD. That project explored lead and neodymium isotopes in the Indian Ocean and what they can tell us about Pleistocene ocean circulation and boundary exchange. After continuing his research at Cambridge for a short spell, he moved to London, firstly as research associate at Imperial College. There, he developed Tim's methodologies to analyze deep sea corals and widened his geographical areas of research to include the Southern Ocean and the North Atlantic. It's also where he first started out on research into sediment provenance and ice sheet dynamics in Antarctica. He spent a year as a senior teaching fellow at Imperial, covering topics ranging from petrology to paleoceanography before moving to UCL. David's areas of interest now include any time in the Cenozoic, but mostly still focusing on the Pleistocene, and he applies several different isotope systems as preserved in a range of marine archives as well as in speleothems to explore paleoenvironmental change. He hopes to understand how terrestrial weathering on land affects the climate system, how Antarctic ice sheet dynamics respond to climate, and how the marine system is affected by these changes. So, a uh, big welcome to you, Dr. Wilson. All right, great, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the chance to speak, and particularly thanks to everyone uh, who's come along. Uh, who's come along uh, this afternoon? Yeah. So, and thanks for the introduction. And I can't. I'm afraid I can't talk about all those things um, today. Um, so I'm going to focus on uh, the Antarctic ice sheet uh, during the last uh, 500,000 years or so. And so this is just an image of the uh, margin of that um, Antarctic ice sheet. Um, and if I, see. Hmm. So, yeah, so what I want to talk about really is just to set the scene is to think about the role of Antarctica uh, in the climate system. So this is the margin. This is showing uh, a cliff at the edge of the Antarctic ice sheet with the with a research vessel with the Polish stern uh, running up close to it. And this just gives you a sense for the scale uh, of the system we're dealing with. Um, now, it's really important because it responds to changes in temperature, changes in climate, but it also is important for changes in climate. So those of you that work on longer timescales will think about how as the Antarctic ice sheet largely grew, perhaps around the onset of the Oligocene, it influenced Earth's albedo, Earth's energy balance, and therefore um, contributed to changes in climate. It's important because it controls things like uh, freshwater balance locally. So if the ice sheet melts, it adds fresh water to the surface ocean, and that can influence the global thermal highland circulation and therefore heat transport uh, between uh, the poles. It's also important because um, one slightly underappreciated in the past aspect of the ice sheet is that it's not entirely just water. It does lead to some weathering influence. Um, icebergs can fertilize the surface ocean uh, by supplying things like iron to the surface ocean, so there can be important in interactions between uh, the cryosphere and biology in the oceans. And perhaps most obviously it's important because um, the ice sheet locks up fresh water and so changes the global uh, sea levels. What am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm mostly going to talk about how we can explore past changes in the Antarctic ice sheet using a series of different tools and in each case uh, a little case study to introduce those. And then just at the very end, so I'll, I'll spend most of the time thinking about those. And then just at the end, I'll give some kind of a synthesis and discuss some of the implications and we can continue that into the uh, discussions. Uh, and some take home messages. Well, firstly, isotopes. I'm an isotope geochemist, perhaps first and foremost. And so a lot of these tools that we use to explore the ice sheet are coming from isotope geochemistry. And also I just wanted to mention that it's a particularly interdisciplinary field. We need expertise in lots of areas to understand a uh, model, reconstruct the ice sheet and, and really collaborative. And so it's been a really interesting uh, world to be involved in uh, working in. Okay, so that's what we're hoping to do. Uh, just a quick pretty picture of, um, to introduce some terms relating to the ice sheet. Um, so you can see here um, where you've got, this is a sort of a, a, a little picture of the Antarctic ice sheet. You can see some places the bedrock is above sea level and some places it's below sea level. So these regions above sea level are continental uh, regions, whereas there are also these marine based regions where the ice sheet sits at levels lower than uh, the sea level. Uh, you can see that you get um, accumulation is essentially from the precipitation via snow. You then get ice flow, ice streams towards the margin where the flow is much faster. And overall, the size of the ice sheet is a reflection of inputs from precipitation and then losses from uh, sublimation, surface mass balance influences, and then from uh, melting. Uh, melting at the surface, but also from 
uh, iceberg carving where the melting then happens um, offshore. So this is the setup and we should think about the ice sheet as being both composed of continental and marine portions. Good, okay. But for today, I'm mostly going to be thinking about changes in the ice sheet and its role in uh, sea level. So thinking about sea level, you can see here, these are the two major polar regions uh, on Earth. And Greenland contains around seven meters sea level equivalent today. So if the Greenland ice sheet melted, then that would contribute seven meters to global sea levels. Uh, West Antarctica, which is one of these mostly marine base sectors, contains around four meters uh, in sea level, whereas East Antarctica contains around 52 meters in sea level, of which around 19 meters is marine based. We can make observations if we're thinking about future changes. Uh, we have satellite evidence. We have um, some constraints on what the ice sheet in Antarctica has been doing over the last 20 to 25 years. Um, if you just focus on the overall Antarctic curve here, you can see a downward trend in the last um, two decades, which is contributing to sea level and increasingly making a big contribution to uh, global sea levels. And really the question is what's going to happen in the future with warming and with increases in atmospheric CO2. So of course we could look at this line and think it's going to continue, it's going to trend uh, downwards like this in the future, but perhaps it's going to be, um, perhaps it's going to change, perhaps the trend will change through time, maybe there won't be bigger changes, maybe it's going to accelerate and steepen, uh, and perhaps it's going to take one of these paths and then suddenly follow some kind of past some kind of tipping point uh, and get very much accelerated flow. So the whole point is that, and, and loss of ice to the ocean. And so the whole point here really is just to say that these satellite observations are absolutely important, but they can't necessarily tell us in and of themselves what might happen in 10, 20, 50, 200 years time, because the system, um, some parts of the system may behave really quite slowly relative to our um, 10, 20 year uh, observational period. And so what I'm going to do in this talk is to tell us, uh, is to look into the future um, by looking back at the past. Um, so this shows uh, a nice uh, reconstruction of the geological history of the Earth uh, since its start. Uh, and I'm just going to focus today on this bit near the top, so in the Pleistocene, uh, which is the last couple of uh, million years of Earth's history. And in the Pleistocene, the benefit of looking at the Pleistocene, one of the benefits, is that we have these fantastic records from the ice cores which constrain temperatures and atmospheric CO2 over this period. And so in this figure, you can see this is the Holocene, the modern warm interglacial, the last glacial maximum, previous interglacials, and et cetera, cycles through time in uh, temperatures reconstructed in Antarctica, uh, and also in atmospheric CO2 reconstructed from bubbles in Antarctica. This red dashed line shows us the modern day Holocene uh, temperatures. And you can see that if we focus on the last 500,000 years, which is the period I'm going to be talking about, and um, today we can see that there are some intervals, um, marine ice slope stage five, marine ice slope stage 11, where temperatures were considerably warmer than during the Holocene for several thousand years. And so these are good um, periods to target to understand how the ice sheet responded to uh, warming and how it could potentially respond to warming that's ongoing uh, today and into the future. Okay, so I'm really just going to run through a series of different tools that allow us to explore um, Antarctica and try to figure out how it's changed in the recent uh, geological past. So first of all, we actually have some theory. Uh, this is not my field for sure, but we actually can uh, construct um, ideas for how the ice sheet could uh, be expected to retreat under warming conditions. And so it's well understood uh, in glaciology that there is a mean, marine ice sheet instability. That's to say, you can see here, this is a figure which shows uh, an ice sheet uh, and its ice shelf and warming uh, from ocean water underneath the ice shelf. And it's sitting on a reverse sloping bed. So this may be the margin of the ice sheet, and then this may be one of those subglacial basins. And in a marine ice sheet instability, if you see melting near the um, grounding line, what you'll see is that the ice sheet retreats into a region where it's thicker. And that means that the flux across the grounding line increases through time, and this can lead to a sustained retreat of the ice sheet. So it's well understood that if you can start a retreat of an ice sheet, it may be hard to stop it. The other process that's been brought into uh, light recently is that of marine ice cliff instability. Uh, now here we're dealing with a situation where you've got um, hydrofracturing and melting that can remove the buttressing ice shelf. And in that case, you can generate a cliff at the grounding line of the ice sheet. And that cliff can be mechanically unstable and therefore collapse, and therefore you could get accelerated retreat of the ice sheet. So we have some idea that there were these two processes 
Um, where the ice sheet sits uh, at below sea level and on a reverse sloping bed, it's likely to be particularly vulnerable to these kinds of instabilities. Now, the important thing to then think about is if we look at Antarctica, what does it look like uh, beneath? And our knowledge of this is much better today than it was, say, 10 years or 20 years ago. Um, this is a map which shows um, the subglacial uh, topography, and you can see the elevation of the bed, and all the blue areas are areas where it's below uh, sea level. And so you can focus on the West Antarctic ice sheet, where clearly the vast majority of the ice sheet sits uh, in subglacial uh, basins that are below uh, sea level. Equally, you can see from this kind of high resolution data that the East Antarctic ice sheet also contains sectors such as the Wilkes subglacial basin, the Aurora basin, and the Recovery basin, which also have deep uh, marine basins. Uh, and so we need to consider the terrestrial portion and the marine based portion of the East Antarctic ice sheet as slightly different uh, beasts. So, okay, we think we have uh, mechanisms that mean that these regions could be susceptible to warming. Uh, we can see where they are in Antarctica today. Um, so that would suggest that we should be able to do some kind of modeling to constrain how stable or unstable these regions could be. So this has been attempted for lots of periods of time with the geological uh, past, uh, but I'm just going to show one example, which is a recent model uh, looking at um, how Antarctica would have behaved during the Pliocene, let's say three to five million years ago during a warm climate. So this is a reconstruction uh, from Rob de Conte's recent paper looking at um, the Pliocene Antarctic ice sheet um, with a ice sheet model that only includes uh, marine ice sheet instability. And in this case, they see uh, some retreat or rather reasonable collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet and some moderate changes along the East Antarctic margin. Um, and in this case, it's contributing around three meters to global sea levels. Uh, as a comparison in the same model, but adding in um, a, a sort of parameterization that allows them to uh, reconstruct marine ice cliff instability. That's to say you're allowing hydrofracture of ice sheets and cliff failure uh, at the front of the uh, ice sheets. Then you can see much more significant retreat, particularly in these subglacial basins of East Antarctica. So this suggests that actually we need to know what physics to put into the ice sheet models in order to constrain uh, what we'll get out of them, of course. Um, and so this is a huge debate at the moment in uh, sort of glaciological and ice sheet modeling uh, literature. And so probably the truth is somewhere in between the two. Um, but the point is we really want to then be able to constrain how the ice sheets behaved in the past to say which of these uh, mechanisms need to be employed in ice sheet models. And that's really important if you want to think about changes uh, in the ice sheets in the future as well. So I'm showing you this, which was a reconstruction, sorry, not reconstruction, like a projection for the future from an earlier paper from uh, De Conto and Pollard. And I'm showing it really to show schematically how and where ice could be melting in Antarctica. I don't want you to take too much note of the uh, time scale because this is probably uh, an extreme case for um, the future. And there's been some more recent work by those authors, also by Tamsin Edwards, that suggests that probably the rate of change in this model is probably a bit too fast, but nevertheless, probably where it ends up at is a future case in an RCP 8.5 scenario, that's to say, an extreme uh, high CO2 emission kind of future that we're all hoping uh, for sure is not going to be quite what we're going to see. Um, but nevertheless, it's a really useful example of how uh, and where the ice sheet could change. And so you can see that the, um, the years are changing along the top. And this is sort of, you can start to see changes here in West Antarctica, in the Amundsen Sea Embayment region, uh, here loss of this connection between these two regions of the West Antarctic ice sheet and retreating uh, the Wilkes uh, and the Aurora basins, for example. And this is sort of progressing and eating into the continent. But of course, the vast majority, even uh, in a really extreme warming scenario, the vast majority of the East Antarctic ice sheet, which is terrestrial based, is not likely to be affected in any scenarios. As I say, the actual time scale and the complete extent of retreat is probably not something that we should take uh, too um, strongly from this particular model, but this gives us a sense of where and uh, how the ice sheet could retreat. Okay, so has that happened in the past? Right, That's then the question that we can address from the geological record. And one way to look at this is to look at how global sea levels have been different uh, under warmer conditions in the past. Um, and so one particular route, and there's various ways of doing this, but one particular route for doing this is to take dated um, corals that grew close to sea level uh, have been uplifted uh, as terraces and we can 
Uh, date B is we can constrain past local sea levels and with several corrections, uh, for glacial static adjustment and the like, get back at a global sea level uh, reconstruction. So during the Pliocene, we know global temperatures were warmer and we know sea levels were warmer. I'm going to focus here on the late Pleistocene, so we're nice to stages five and 11. And again, we see global mean temperatures perhaps one to two degrees warmer, sea levels sort of six to nine meters elevated during stage five, possibly larger during stage 11. So there's a really nice talk um, explaining how this is done and some of the details and complexities from uh, Natasha Barley the other week, uh, the other month. And so for all the details of that, I suggest you uh, refer to that. But the point is having constrained that there were sea level uh, differences during these past interglacials, and we can think about marine ice state stage five here, we can think about how that relates to the amount of ice contained in the different ice sheets. And in Greenland, there's seven meters, but constraints from uh, Greenland during the last interglacial, during stage 5b, suggest no more than a couple of meters um, uh, contribution to global sea level. And if we think about the timing of those changes, it may be, but may, it may be that global sea level changed at a different time, but the peak in global sea level occurred at a time when there'd been no changes in Greenland. And in that case, if we're looking to explain six, seven, eight meters of sea level during the last interglacial, we need to be looking to Antarctica and potentially both the West Antarctic ice sheet and the East Antarctic ice sheet. So we have these global uh, far field constraints that tell us we need to be looking for ice loss uh, from somewhere. And that at least some of this must be from Antarctica. Okay, so that's where we stand on a sort of global picture. Uh, the second uh, half of the uh, case studies is coming from uh, more regional studies of Antarctica and some of the work that I've been uh, involved in. And so here we're going to use uh, isotope tracers to look at specific parts of the Antarctic margin and assess if it's seen, if those regions have seen changes in the past. Okay, so how does this work? Well, we don't need to go too much into the details here, except to note that through time uh, in different rocks, um, either rocks of different ages or rocks with different samarium to neodymium uh, ratios will have evolved a different amount of 143 neodymium, which is this radiogenic daughter from samarium decay relative to 144 neodymium. And so today, which is at this right-hand side of this diagram, you can see differences, different rocks, be it cross, old crustal rocks or recent mantle-derived rocks will have different need new isotope compositions. So we can use that to fingerprint where rocks have come from uh, and or where sediments have come from, which rocks they relate to. And the other important um, aspect of applying this tool is that erosion by an ice sheet occurs mostly in the ice streams right near the margin. So even though ice flows ultimately across the whole of Antarctica, the fast flow and the erosion occurs right near the base. And so you have a marker for where the ice sheet is um, close to its margin, not strictly the grounding line, but close to its margin. And this is shown schematically in this figure here. Okay, so if you have a situation where the bedrock geology differs in land, so you have some beds that are parallel to the coastline, um, the ice sheet is mostly eroding right near its margin where its ice stream is hitting into the ocean. And you're seeing in this instance, rock sea, this brown rock, being eroded and transported, dumped on the shelf, carried down uh, the, the slope uh, in turbidity currents and deposited in sediment core, also exported via ice rafted debris and transported via that route to a sediment core and dumped in the ocean. You can therefore see that if this ice sheet would retreat, for example, into so that its margin sat more uh, in the vicinity of rock B, you're going to start to see these green rocks being eroded and carried and transported off to the margin. So this is a particular setup, doesn't mean it works everywhere, where if you have different rock types uh, between uh, in different locations of the ice sheet, then you can see that signature potentially in a record from offshore. So that's going to be the approach I'm taking in this particular example, which is um, some work based on core uh, U1361A from offshore of the Wilkes Subglacial Basin, which was recovered from an IODP expedition around a decade ago, I suppose or so now. Uh, and just to flag at this point, um, I'm mentioning this particular paper that we worked on. Uh, this is the team that I worked with, uh, and it's, I just want to say sort of thanks to all these great people uh, who all contributed in different areas. We don't just use isotopic provenance, which is the, the group of us at Imperial, uh, but we also relied on uh, sedimentology of the cores, which was worked by uh, Kevin Welsh and Rob Mackay. Uh, we worked on the diatoms to look at the environment and to use these as a constraint on age models, which is from Ananaya and Christina, uh, and also uh, looking at XRF scanning from Carlotta and Francis. So we have to use multiple tools to know where we are in time to trace the paleo environment, but obviously my focus is on the uh, isotope work. 
Okay, so we've got our sediments. We go to a clean lab. We need to separate the uh, detrital component, that's to say the eroded uh, rocks or the eroded sediment from that core. Uh, there's different stuff that you can potentially find in the marine sediment core, and you maybe need to uh, leach to remove other fractions, for example, ferromagnetic oxide coatings that reflect uh, bottom water or pore water signatures. Then we get back at the detrital material, which we can then uh, digest. Go to a uh, clean lab. We can separate um, the neodymium from the other uh, elements using column chemistry. This is a bit like um, uh, kind of chromatography that you might have used at school, where you're trying to separate all the different fractions from this mixture. And that's exactly what we're doing here, separate just a pure fraction uh, of neodymium. Uh, just to say, yeah, that if anyone who's an expert here and thinks I don't know what I'm talking about, these are actually lithium columns. I've been working most recently uh, in UCL on some weathering studies using lithium rather than neodymium isotopes, and that's the picture uh, that I happen to have that I can show you uh, to set the scene for, for the column chemistry. So maybe in, in a future time, I'll be talking more about the weathering uh, story. Okay, so we then uh, go to a multi-collector ICPMS to measure the neodymium isotopes on those fractions extracted from the sediment. Um, so this is schematically, basically we inject uh, our samples uh, into the plasma. This is kind of like the surface of the sun. Uh, they go through a filter to ensure you only have a beam of certain energies. Uh, we accelerate them through an electric field and through uh, in a magnet and collect the neodymium isotopes in cups at the end. Okay. So what we're looking at is the relative proportions of 143 uh, and 144 neodymium, which is tracing uh, the different sediment provenance. Okay. So to show you the data, this is um, the sedimentology basically in this core. Um, so the core depth is the top seven and a half meters. You can see cycles between high reflectance and low reflectance, high diatom content and low diatom content, and high productivity and low productivity inferred from barium to aluminium ratios. We can then look at the iceberg rafted sand. So that's the fraction greater than uh, 250 microns in this case. And we can see some cycles uh, also in the iceberg rafting, and that can tell us about retreats of the ice margin or dynamic behavior at the ice margin. And you can also see I've added on for these orange bars, um, these represent the marine ice state stages one, five, seven, nine, and 11. That's to say uh, these interglacial periods uh, with some constraints uh, in terms of uh, biostratigraphy for the age model. And then here was the detrital sediment provenance record. And you can see, for example, modest changes in new denium isotopes during the Holocene and LGM. But certain periods of the past showing much uh, more dramatic uh, changes in neodymium isotopic composition that are really well resolved in comparison, for example, to analytical uh, uncertainties in this kind of data set. So how do we interpret these shifts in um, between older um, rocks during glacial periods and effectively younger uh, sources during uh, interglacial periods? Uh, and just to say, we can also trace these rock types using strontium isotopes, which are not plotted on that previous diagram and we can see fluctuations through time such that the glacials seem to correspond to this blue rock type which are lower paleozoic granitoids and the interglacials shift more towards rocks of the uh, jurassic farrar large igneous province and, and its associated um, sediments and so if we put this on a map we can see that the uh, glacial intervals in this core are largely reflecting these blue rocks which are exposed in the vicinity of the Ninus glacier uh, grounding line, whereas during the warmer interglacials we're seeing a signature from uh, the uh, basaltic rocks that are found within the interior of the Wilkes subglacial basin. So it appears that we have um, a signature which shows um, during you know, stage 5, for example, and stage 9 and 11, um, a, a, a retreat inland of that erosional band, which could either reflect marginal retreat or a sort of thinning and flow acceleration of the ice sheet near its margin. So this is just taking the detrital neodymium state record in the middle in red and inferring greater retreat of that margin during intervals when the neodymium isotope signature was more radiogenic or higher on this diagram than the modern, which is shown by the dashed line. And so we highlighted particularly marine isotope stage five and marine isotope stage 11 as intervals with a greater retreat of that margin. And they appear to correspond to uh, warmer Antarctic temperatures. So as I said, these intervals had previous, these previous interglacials had warmer temperatures than the Holocene. And they also correspond to intervals when global sea level reconstructions point to uh, greater ice loss uh, than seen during the Holocene. 
And so really the simple uh, take home at this point would be that there is a retreat during particularly stage five and stage 11, and that requires uh, a sustained regional warmth of two degrees or so above pre-industrial conditions for several uh, thousand years. So for example, stage seven and the Holocene see rather much more muted responses when the temperature forcing was shorter. Okay, so that's one, one record from one setting. I'm not going to show any other isotopic records at this point, largely because they don't yet exist or, or are, there is work in progress by several uh, groups around the country and around the world. Um, but for now, actually, we don't always have to use isotopes to trace uh, changes in the ice sheet. We could also use other uh, traces such as clay mineralogy. So I'm going to show you an example from a different setting, which is from uh, Pritz Bay offshore, the Lambert Glacier uh, Emory Ice Shelf System. Uh, and from this core P12, or in fact, from two cores, but these are, it's kind of like a comparable setting to the core offshore Wilkes Basin, uh, but relating to a different glaciological system in Antarctica. Okay. So yeah, this is the Lumber Glacier and Rio Ice Shelf System, shortened to LGAISS. Um, yep, so this is work conducted by Li Wei. Um, and what you'll see here is two cores which show similar fluctuations in sediment properties. So diatom rich layers during the interglacials and silty clays during the glacials, uh, as we saw offshore the Wilkes Basin. And what he's got plotted here through time um, is for the last 500,000 years, from 500,000 years ago through to modern, um, changes in illite, kaolinite, smectite, and chloride content. Uh, and you can see highlighted the glacial periods. Now, we're not going to interpret directly those uh, exact records because we can make things a bit simpler by looking at where those uh, clay compositions plot on a ternary diagram. So you could probably pretty much ignore this left-hand diagram and just focus on this triangle uh, down here. And you can see that we can plot the proportions of illite, kaolinite, and smectite. And the, um, the red data are from interglacials and the green data are from glacials. And we can also identify N members which can mix to generate those compositions. So the illite rich end member uh, can be related to most to um, physical erosion of Antarctic rocks. Um, a smectite rich end member can be related to inputs from Kerguelen, which is offshore in this sector of the uh, ocean, of the Indian Ocean. And the Lambert Glacier and Ice Shelf System itself, uh, within, the, within that system, within the base, um, sorry, at the base of the um, ice stream, et cetera, has a higher kaolinite content that reflects previous sedimentary cycles of deposition in that region, probably under a warmer climate. And so we can explain um, with clay mineralogy at this content of rise site as a mixture between these different sources. And in fact, simply relate um, and relate that to what the ice shelf was doing. And so in this diagram, this shows the ice shelf system. This shows the content of rise, slope and rise and the cores. And yellow is tracing the end member, which end member two, which is rich in kaolinite, which is sourced from the margins and the base of the Lambert Glacier. Uh, and blue is highlighting um, the general inputs um, of, from physical erosion uh, around other margins of Antarctica, the most typical um, clay minerals that are found around Antarctica. And this setting, this schematic shows the situation during interglacials, a bit like the Holocene, where the, um, ice, sheet is, um, the ice shelf is relatively retreated. Um, you've got second polar deep water upwelling onto the shelf. You've got relatively high insulation, high productivity. Um, and you'll see at the core, you've got very little of the uh, material from the Lambic Glacier system is making it to uh, the core site. In contrast, during glacial periods, as the ice shelf expands uh, across the shelf, as the ice sheet, um, you'll see that you've got um, a abundance of this EM2, this kaolinite rich um, end member being deposited uh, near, the, near the margin of the ice shelf. You've got um, expanded sea ice across the uh, site. You've got um, iceberg uh, rafting supplying um, IRD to the core. And so you're seeing a, a sort of signatures in the core which reflect um, an expanded um, Lumber Glacier uh, Amory ice shelf system in that region. So we can trace advance. In this case, it appears slightly different from the Wilk setting. We're tracing advance and retreat of this ice shelf system uh, across the shelf. So we can do the same thing. So that was just sort of schematically showing how 
those two situations could arise. But we can actually look at this through time in a time series. Now, looking at n member two over n member one plus n member two. So that's basically saying how much uh, of that um, signature are we seeing from the lambic glacier and making it to the core site. So in this plot, just to orient, orient you, um, down at the bottom, this is the epicodome uh, temperature reconstruction again. This is a Southern Ocean sea surface temperature reconstruction. This is productivity uh, at the Pritz Bay uh, sites that I'm talking about. Um, this is the uh, Wilkes land or Wilkes uh, spatial basin reconstruction that we've made that I've showed you in the last part of the talk. Um, and then up here, you've got modeled Antarctic ice volumes, uh, global sea level reconstructions and summer insulation uh, in Antarctica with the glacials highlighted in uh, blue and intervals of enhanced uh, insulation in yellow. And what we see in this reconstruction um, is some similar kind of patterns to what we've seen in Wilkes land, or Wilkes Glacier Basin, I should say, sorry, George V land. Um, for example, stage seven, where we saw a muted responses is also more muted. It's not reaching the full retreat signatures that we see even of the Holocene, let alone of stage five, uh, nine or 11. Uh, we also see um, a signature in the claim neurology that's less extreme during the LGM than stage four, than is seen in stage six or stage uh, eight, which suggests limited, uh, more limited advance of that ice shelf system across the shelf at the LGM. Um, but there are also some differences. So this record doesn't look exactly like this record. There's more of a, um, so for example, we can see multiple uh, events that potentially relate to these um, insulation peaks, which suggests more of a control by local insulation forcing on the ice shelf uh, behavior uh, in, in, in Pritz Bay. Uh, we also see this really interesting interval in stage 13 with the most retreat like signature, that's to say the lowest um, uh, Kaolinite proportions at the core site. Uh, and so this potentially suggests that our uh, most retreated state of that ice shelf system was during stage 13, which followed this extended period of warmth of stage 13, 14, and 15, which has in the past, in some instances, uh, so for example, for the West Antarctic ice sheet, been suggested to have been related to retreat uh, because of that extended warmth rather than particularly warm temperatures that work from CD uh, Hillenbrand, for example, uh, for West Antarctica. So there's some interesting features uh, of this claim neurology record from this different setting. Okay, so there's two more tools I want to show you um, because those two things are sort of semi-quantitative or qualitative comparisons that we can make between different uh, periods, but we can't necessarily use them to constrain quantitatively how much the ice sheet margin um, has retreated in those regions. And so here you can see for the Wilkes of Glacial Basin um, several models, these dashed lines reflect uh, potential grounding line positions during different retreat states. The details don't really matter uh, for now, but the point being that there are ice cores in different locations. These are your sort of typical East Antarctic plateau ice cores, but there's also tailed ice, which is sat near the margin of the Wilkes Glacial Basin. Uh, and some work, uh, several authors in the last sort of decade have looked at the ice core records and noticed that um, tailed ice records a particular uh, peak, which is not so much seen, or in fact not seen in the plateau sites. So one way to get a peak in the ice core records is warming, and that local warming seems unlikely. And so actually that could be a decrease in elevation at towel ice. Uh, so a study came out uh, just last year, which was looking at how the elevation at towel ice ice core in different modeled scenarios would translate into sea level changes. And by comparing the uh, elevation changes inferred from the ice state record, they could relate to which of these um, models was likely to apply. And basically the conclusion from Sutter et al was that um, you could have had thinning in stage 5e of around 100 to 200 meters, which could have contributed uh, a maximum of around half a meter or so to global sea level. Um, so that's to say a scenario more like kind of retreats at the margin here, rather than a full whole scale retreat of the basin that would release around four meters uh, to global sea level. So a fairly modest contribution, but nevertheless, um, it's worth saying that if you add that up from three or four subglacial basins of East Antarctica, that could still be several, uh, two to three metres, for example, and could still be relevant to both um, past interglacial ice budgets and future changes. Um, and just to say that um, the scientists who've been working on tailed ice uh, have been have progressed with higher resolution 
uh, iState records for stage seven and nine. Uh, and I've been working with uh, trying to in, trying to sort of relate what they see for those past integrations to our uh, record from uh, U1361A. So there may be a little bit more to come uh, from the perspective of can we constrain the amount of retreat in the Wilkes of Glacial Basin. And then finally, um, there was some neat work that also came out last year that was trying to say, can we not so much even trace the amount of changes in the basin, but can we see signatures of collapse or non-collapse of the ice sheet in a region? Um, now, these authors used um, subglacial precipitates of you know, the likes of opal and calcite that can form at the base of an ice sheet and subsequently be recovered, for example, from moraines. And I just want you to focus on uh, one sample that they collected from elephant moraine uh, near the margin of the Wilkes Basin, uh, quite an inland portion of it. And so that's this sample here. And you're able to date these samples with uranium series. And what they saw, so only focus um, on these points here, which relate to basically the base through to the top of this sample. And what they see is the sample was roughly sort of 250,000 years old at the base, 150,000 years old at the top, and that it's delta 234 uranium initial, that's its initial uranium isotopic composition, was evolving through time as it, as it grew, and it wasn't matching what you would expect if you just had seawater there, and it wasn't matching what you'd expect if you'd let seawater sit there and accumulate 234 uranium uh, from uh, following decay from 238 uranium and uh, emission into the waters. So it was some middle ground, and they basically modeled the evolution of this trend and suggested that it was reflecting uh, a marine incursion that gave you seawater-like um, values at around 400,000 years ago that's subsequently been evolving by interaction with uh, subglacial sediments um, with alpha recoil providing 234 uranium to those waters towards, but not yet reaching the steady state value. So they said this is really strong evidence for a marine incursion into this basin reflecting collapse, and then its subsequent evolution. So in this case, we can actually constrain, and this is one sample, and it's obviously going to be a direction that people are going to be working on a bit more, I'm sure, to see how representative it is. But these authors suggested that you've got major retreat into the basin in stage 11, um, but then the fact that that signature wasn't reset for example, during the United States stage seven back to seawater, would suggest that actually the retreat that we're suggesting from the marginal records was only uh, indeed rather marginal and not a wholesale collapse uh, of the Wilkes Basin, which is probably consistent with uh, global sea level reconstructions from the United States stage five uh, and the idea that, that West Antarctica may have contributed significantly to the United States stage five. Good, okay, so that's a quick run through of um, the different tools we can use to look at you know, changes through time and potentially quantify changes uh, in the Antarctic ice sheet. So I think I've just got uh, three or four uh, slides to give a, a little bit of a big picture uh, synthesis and overview uh, before we come to the questions. Uh, so firstly, um, I focused in what I've shown you here on these sort of past warm interglacials within the last uh, half a million years. And there's lots of good reasons why they're good to focus on, because for example, you know, the ice sheet um, uh, subglacial topography um, probably is most similar to today in this period than it was uh, 5 million years ago, etc. But actually the warm Pliocene period is also a really good comparison to make because we had temperatures that were slightly warmer than during these, uh, at least globally, during these um, late Pleistocene super interglacials, uh, CO2 levels that were higher and sea level was high, probably uh, a bit higher. And so we can compare uh, our record from the Pleistocene, uh, and here I'm showing again in red, this is this Triton Neodymium state record, which suggests retreat up and advance down, um, and barium's aluminium is the productivity record. You can compare that to uh, similar work from Rachel Bertram, uh, and she showed uh, these patterns looking at really high resolution or as high resolution as we could look at during the Ply Pleistocene, and you see almost you know, identical, remarkably identical records in terms of productivity changes, magnitude patterns of um, provenance change. So this suggests really similar behavior in this region during both the Pliocene and the Pleistocene. So that's interesting because it suggests similar behavior in this specific basin, at least, despite differences in global temperatures uh, and differences in uh, global uh, CO2 levels. So why should the basin be able to respond 
similarly, during the late Pleistocene, they'd be sensitive and responsive um, as during the Pliocene. Well, one possibility here, which has become increasingly prevalent in the last couple of years in a couple of papers that have been published, is that um, we need to care. We don't really care in Antarctica about global CO2 or global temperature. We only care about those to the extent that they influence local temperatures in the subsurface ocean around Antarctica uh, or sort of dynamics of transport of that heat across the shelf in Antarctica. And so um, if you have, if you consider the concept of the bipolar seesaw, if we have a situation with a uh, weak uh, Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, potentially forced by freshwater inputs in the North Atlantic, but potentially um, arising uh, for other purposes, and then that can lead to uh, the heat build up in the interior ocean uh, and in the southern ocean. And that can then be what's influencing the Antarctic ice sheet during the late Pleistocene. And if we have particularly big northern hemisphere ice sheets, it may be that those are responsible for leading to stronger fluctuations in the Atlantic uh, overturning circulation. So how this plays out during the last interglacial can be seen in various compilations. So I've taken this one from Ilko Rowling, which basically looks at Heinrich Stadial 11, Heinrich Stadial 11, which is at the end of Marine Ice Stage, stage 6, um, and it's shown in yellow. And what you can see here is that CO2 was increasing, which is shown uh, in blue, and Antarctic temperatures were increasing, which is shown in red, but Greenland temperatures or North Atlantic temperatures were still really cold uh, because uh, sea ice was probably expanded and the Atlantic overturning circulation was weak. And that means that this warmth was responsible for, um, could be responsible for warming and melting in Antarctica to generate this peak of around six meters uh, sea level during the start of the last interglacial. While actually it was so cold that Greenland may not have actually been responding at that point. And so the Greenland response during the last interglacial may have been uh, somewhat delayed. And that's seen in a planktonic R18 record from Eric Drift. And I think this is a model curve, I can't quite remember. But, but, but basically, this is saying that actually this peak in global sea level could be coming all from Antarctica as a response to um, the Atlantic overturning circulation perturbations during Heinrich Stadia 11. So that means that I think when we're thinking about the ice sheet, we need to be thinking uh, a bit more specifically about what's going on regionally in terms of uh, climate and ocean circulation rather than simply um, global conditions. Two more things to say, um, one of which is I focused on East Antarctica because that's the region that I've worked on uh, and I've not worked very much on West Antarctica, but some of the similar tools and ideas I've presented uh, can be applied in West Antarctica. This is a different tool. Rather than looking at the oxygen or deuterium isotopes in the ice cores, uh, this study, uh, if it's Turney and others, looked at, the, um, looked at a horizontal blue ice uh, record, blue ice core from near the Weddell um, sea embayment. And what they see, if you look in blue here, so this is their delta D record from that ice core through the Holocene, the last glacial period. They then see a gap. Uh, and in terms of dating, there was no ice recovered from this interval. And the previous bit of ice records warm temperatures that correspond to uh, sort of termination two, roughly speaking. So they suggest that this lack of um, uh, core recovery, or lack of ice core recovery in that interval reflects a reorganization of ice flow uh, and retreat in the vicinity of the Weddell uh, Sea, so retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet during the last interglacial. And a study recently came out uh, just a couple of, uh, a couple of months ago, some time this year, from Anders Carlson. And without going too much into the details for now, what they were looking at was a, a sediment core from the Antarctic Peninsula on the sort of continental rise. And they suggested that the sediment was supplied, the fine grain sediment, that this is that they were working on, was supplied by the Antarctic Circumpolar Current and could reflect either inputs from Antarctic Peninsula, so local inputs would have a composition close to zero in terms of epsilon Neodymium values, while inputs from the Amundsen Sea embayment could be more um, unradiogenic so in this direction. And they say that through their record, they see uh, a fluctuations, a range of Sometimes this is sea sediment from the Antarctic Peninsula, sometimes from the Amundsen Sea Embayment. Uh, but if you focus in on MIS-5e, that's the last interglacial, they only see local sediment supplied from the Antarctic Peninsula. And they suggest that could indicate uh, a retreat and, uh, of the West Antarctic ice sheet in the vicinity of the Amundsen Sea, which reduced basically that input of those sediments into the ACC to be transported to the site. 
Um, so you might come up with some other interpretations for that record, but broadly speaking, it seems there's now starting to be some evidence converging on the idea of retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet during the last interglacial. And finally, um, I don't want to say too much about this figure, I think, um, except to highlight that um, there's a very nice synthesis that's just come out, which was led by um, Flo Colioni, and this was looking at various intervals of Earth's geological his history and warmer times, uh, like, say, the Miocene, the Pliocene, MIS-31, then these late Pleistocene interglacials I've just mentioned, and looking at global CO2 compilations, um, global and Antarctic temperature anomalies, uh, sea surface temperature anomalies, sea ice and sea levels change. So trying to make sense of the sensitivity of these different regions of the Antarctic ice sheet under these different warming conditions. And really, I'm only showing it now just to highlight the that while I've sort of suggested that this is perhaps a really, really important interval to look at, because we have good records and we have the ice core records and there's lots of things that we know very well about the last uh, few hundred thousand years of the Pleistocene, actually for stage five and stage 11, the constraints on things like um, local sea surface temperature anomalies from the continent rise and shelf of Antarctica, uh, sea ice presence and absence in different regions is actually still really poorly constrained. And so this is kind of a call to arms that this is clearly uh, a future target that, and I think people are now working on some of these things, so there will probably be some better constraints on the local climate forcing for Antarctica, uh, hopefully uh, fairly soon. So um, yeah, made it to the end. Um, let me give you some quick conclusions. So hopefully I've shown you uh, in this talk that we really need to take multiple approaches to make sense of and try and constrain past changes in Antarctica. And hopefully some of these early explorations are starting to reach um, a stage where we can say a bit more uh, than we perhaps could five or 10 years ago. Um, yeah, it looks like we're seeing a similar retreat behavior in the Wilkes of Glacial Basin during both late Pleistocene superinterglacials and the Pliocene. And that may be a series of different forcings that combine to lead to a similar sensitivity today as, uh, as in that region during the Pliocene. And that was potentially linked to ocean forcing. Um, the extent of retreat was variable, um, is, as suggested by comparison to some of the uh, ice core work and the marine, uh, sorry, uh, subglacial precipitate work. Uh, that's not yet fully constrained. And it may be that actually it, this region was contributed to sea level during stage five E, but a relatively small one, and there was great collapse in stage 11. The work that I showed from uh, clay mineralogy uh, from the Lambert Glacier system suggests actually, uh, again, that the duration of warming rather than absolute warming could be important for changes in the ice margin because uh, the biggest changes are seen in uh, marine ice shape stage 13. Uh, and finally, there's several lines of evidence are pointing towards um, significant retreat of the West Antarctic ice sheet during stage five E. So finally, uh, some acknowledgements. Uh, thanks to the various organizations and funders that have been responsible for uh, helping me along, along the way in some of this work that I presented to you uh, today. Uh, thanks to my co-authors and collaborators, uh, many of whom I showed in that uh, earlier slide uh, in the work that uh, I presented here, that at least, at least the work that involved uh, me. And just to flag that um, at long last, uh, the second edition of uh, Antarctic Climate Evolution has just been published. And there were some uh, very nice chapters in there, depending on the time period that you're interested in, uh, but particularly chapter 12, which is a synthesis, synthesis of basically all periods of past and future Antarctic ice sheet, I would really recommend uh, a close look at. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for your attention. And hopefully there's a few minutes at least for uh, some questions. Thanks. <laughs>